Welcome back to Decouple. Uh, we are live here at the Canadian Nuclear Association meeting up in Ottawa, um, meeting all kinds of really interesting, fabulous people. Uh, just chatted with uh, Douglas Borham, uh, radiation biologist. He told me that radiation biology is uh, maybe a dying field, that there's not enough people in it. Um, so I'm really excited to have a second radiation biologist on to nerd out about uh, all things radiation. Um, I've got a special guest here, Chris Tomei. Um, and the little I know about Chris Tomey, he's a student actually of uh, Douglas Borhans, um, but he's involved with a very interesting place uh, called the Snow Lab up in Sudbury, and he's looking at uh, essentially radiation-free environments and its effect on uh, biological systems. So Chris, uh, welcome. Thank you. I, you know, I gave you a, a pretty uh, superficial introduction, so let, help us get to know you a sure, little bit yeah. more. Well, no, you're, you're yeah. right. I, you know, I started off as a, as a student under, under Doug Borham, but then um, got a degree in, in medical physics and health physics, but kind of focused on the, the radiation biology side of things, and now I'm a professor up at the, the medical school in, in Sudbury at uh, Nelson University. Awesome, awesome. So, yeah, let's see, we, we have a lot to discuss. I'm, I'm really interested in uh, your work on radon, um, but also, why don't we start off by you describing the Snow Lab, because it sounds like a pretty incredible sure, yeah, facility. Sure, so, yeah, so it is, and I mean, it's one of a kind in Canada, and one of only a few facilities like this in the world. Um, so it was originally designed, it's just outside of Sudbury, and so it was designed for, for astroparticle physics, and, and they're looking at things like neutrinos and dark matter. Um, and so by going deep underground, they have that two kilometers of, of overhead rock, which basically shields out all, all cosmic radiation. Wow. And so when, when we moved up to Sudbury and started our radiation biology program up there, we kind of realized that this might be the perfect facility to right. do some, some radiation biology. Because you know they're they're going underground to shield from the cosmic radiation that's a um, uh, you know a background source for their detectors, but we can use that facility to actually look at what is the effect of of natural background radiation, and we can look at that by actually removing background radiation. Right. So, you know, with everyone's fears about about ionizing radiation, what what a lot of people don't realize is that it's something that we're exposed to all the time on a daily basis. Yeah. And I mean, the, and not the, just medical, but right. it, and the inference of the linear no threshold hypothesis is that any amount of radiation is dangerous, which you know on the, on the other side means that you would assume that well, a no radiation environment is is the healthiest thing around or the healthiest thing possible. Exactly, and so that that's kind of what we're, what we're looking at there. Mm -hmm. And so you know, all of these experiments that people do looking at effects of low dose radiation and, and really low dose rate kind of stuff, right? You still have that background source in there. Right. So by going down into snow lab, we've set up a, a lab there where we can look at what is the effect of removing essentially all sources of radiation. Right. So what, what, what are to? those sources? Because I think that's mysterious. Like It was kind of news to me some time ago that we actually had natural background radiation, right, to be yeah. honest. But what are the main sources to, to human beings? So we've got a few different ones. So there's cosmic radiation. Right. So that's what you know, astronauts in space are exposed to a lot higher levels of that. We get different types here due to interactions of that with the atmosphere. Um, that contributes some to our background radiation. We also get some from just natural like radioisotopes in the ground. So this is things like you know, uranium, uh, potassium-40, those types of what we call primordial isotopes. Right. So they've been around since the Billion Big Bang. Billion year half-lives. And they've got and such long half-lives that they're still around in, in appreciable amounts. Right. We also get some from, from internal exposures, from foods that we eat, things that we drink. So there's low levels of tritium in, in drinking water. Um, potassium-40 is common in bananas and other foods like that. Right. Carbon-14 as well. Uh, but the, the biggest source that we get is from radon. And so right. radon is a decay product of, of naturally occurring uranium. Uh, it's an inert gas, so once uranium decays to radon, that's when it can and seep out into things like basements and, and mines. Right. And so we, we inhale radon gas, and some of those decay products give us a, a low natural background uh, dose. And so that's where the majority of our of our natural background radiation. And comes there's from. a lot of a lot of fear around radon, um, particularly around questions about lung cancer. Um, and so I, I think Health Canada has some guidelines about how much you can be exposed to. But right. what what's you know, what's the state of the science in terms of understanding that risk or potential risk? Well, as of right now, we still don't really know. Right. Most of those regulations are just based on, on epidemiology, right. uh, a lot of it from uranium miners, uh, but those cohorts, you know, have a lot of confounding variables as well. Right. And so we still don't really understand what like, happens. Like smoking the, is the main thing? Uh, it's a huge one. We know, that, we know that, yeah, all of those things. Smoking right. in particular uh, right. functions really synergistically with, with radon. Right. Um, so it's really hard with some of those cohorts to, to understand what the risk levels actually are. What about um, Ramsar, Iran, which is, I think, has the highest natural background dose of radiation to any right. human population on the planet. Uh, I guess it'd be over 100 times what we get here in, right. in Ontario. Um, you know, are there, is, is that a good population to look at? Because I understand most of that exposure is they live in these houses that are made out of 
you know, not uranium bricks or thorium bricks, but they, you know, there's a high right. content. So what, what, this what data do we have on that cohort? Well, we have data that shows essentially nothing. Right. And so that's one of the main arguments that people have against the linear no threshold model is that if you say that if you give a CT scan to someone, that's going to increase their cancer risk. Well, we have people that are living in regions of the world that are getting 10 times or 100 times the natural background dose of someone um, here in Canada. Yeah. And we're not seeing huge increases in cancer levels in that, those populations. Right. And so that doesn't really you know, correlate to that LNT model. Right, right. And I mean, that's, that's the big thing with the, I think, some of the Fukushima evacuation controversy. If you were to apply um, on a radiation level the, the same sort of uh, restrictions in terms of where people can live, you'd have to evacuate, certainly Ramsar, Iran, you'd have to evacuate Kerala, India. Um, so it's, it's, a lot it's of interesting. Rocky Mountain states, too, or higher yeah. levels of uh, yeah. cosmic radiation. Yeah. I mean, I, would, like, I love Colorado. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to live down there if I had the chance, but yeah, it's 10, 10 millisieverts, I think, in some of the higher, yeah. higher dose rate places. Yeah. Which yeah. is a CT scan a year, or? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. So let's, uh, you talk, we talked about some of these uh, sources of radiation, so how are you eliminating these? You, you said, you know, you, how, I mean, first off, how deep do you need to dig to actually get away from those cosmic rays? Is that overkill two kilometers deep? And then how, what are the other measures you take to eliminate those other sources like potassium 40 or carbon 14 or, or the other ones? Right, so, for our sake, it's a little overkill. So we're two kilometers underground. Right? right. And that's equivalent, that two kilometers of rock is equivalent to about six kilometers of, of water shielding. Wow. So if you think, you know, in terms of shielding levels that you might have in like an x-ray suite or some of those, you know, uh, rooms, it's we're, we are overkill for what we need. For a lot of the other experiments, the, the kind of astroparticle physics experiments, you know, they're looking at such rare events right. and, and particle interactions that they need to get rid of, you know, essentially everything that they that they can. Right. Um, so so cosmic I mentioned is one of our sources. We can pretty much get rid of all cosmic by going underground. Right. The biggest ones for us then are we have some gamma radiation still. So we, we have natural radioisotopes in the rock around the lab and so as they decay they're emitting gamma rays and so right. some of those will enter into the lab. And then radon is, is the other big one for us. So radon levels down there are about uh, around 150 becquerels per, per cubic meter. So that means in one cubic meter of air, yeah. so becquerel is just a measure of, of how radioactive. How exactly. Yeah. So 150 becquerels in one cubic meter of air means that in every second, there's 150 atoms of radon going through a decay. And that's very little. It's, that's I mean, it sounds like low. a lot. Before, it sounds like yeah. a lot, but yeah. it is pretty low. So Health Canada's yeah. recommendation right now is 200 becquerels okay. per cubic meter. Okay. Um, people have much higher levels in their basement, so it's it's still comparably low. So, so how do you eliminate that that dose in, within the lab? Right. So, in terms of eliminating it in the whole lab, it's tough to do because it's right. constantly being emitted. But what we did is we built a specialized incubator to grow our, our biological samples in. It's basically like a, a very technical glove box that we right. can work in. The one nice thing about radon is it does have a very short half-life. So right. it's got a half-life of 3.8 days. Right. So what we're able to do is fill up gas cylinders, compressed gas cylinders, uh, with air, yeah. let them sit for about a month or two, yeah. and then our radon levels will have decayed to, to basically insignificant levels. Right. So it's stale, and then we can the secret is in. really stale Old air. Aged stale air, I'm thinking exactly. of these like, you know, office buildings from like the 80s where they, you know, didn't, didn't I mean, they recycle the air, but yeah, it's, you yeah. feel like you're breathing air that's 20 exactly. years old. Yeah. yeah, which for us is actually a, a good thing. Right. And I mean, the other thing we didn't really think about when we were setting all of this up too is that not only do we have to control the air itself, right. um, but all of the materials that we're using, all of the, the stuff to build our, our, our glove box, the flasks that we're growing cells in, right. they've all got really low levels of uranium contamination in them as well. Right. So all of that stuff is emitting radon too. Right. And so you know, in, by building a sealed compartment, if we're not careful with the materials we use, right. we could actually have higher levels of radon as it, as it emits. Uh, and so we work with the, Snow Lab has a great team of, of engineers and, and, and scientists there, and they're experts in terms of radon control. And so they knew exactly what materials to use so that they would have low emanation rates of radon. Right. And so we've built this, this incubator slash glove box that has lower levels compared to the lab underground, but also lower levels than you even just get on the surface up here. Right. So we're down yeah. below, I mentioned 150 was kind of the average in the lab there. We're down below one becquerel per, per cubic shit. meter within the, the glove box. Now, I understand potassium-40 is a huge challenge. It's a naturally occurring radioisotope. Uh, it's like 0, 0.00 something of, of all right. potassium. Potassium is the dominant intracellular cation. I remember that from, from my medical studies. Yeah. I don't remember much of the basic science anymore, but yeah. um, you know that's bathing our DNA. It's the predominant thing inside our cells. Uh, 
Um, and I understand it's a significant dose of radiation. So how do you grow these organisms without potassium-40? Right, and that's something we're just getting into now. So we've, through going underground to Snow Lab by building this, this incubation uh, chamber glove box, we also have some lead shielding on that too to get rid of the, the gammas that I was talking about. Yeah. So we can get rid of all of the, the external sources. But we have that internal source of potassium-40. Because yeah. we have to, you know, potassium is something that all of our, whether it's human cells or, or yeast or whatever we're growing, they need potassium in order to survive. Right. And as you mentioned, it's, it's less than 0.01% of all potassium is potassium-40. Right. But that still gives an appreciable dose, especially when we're in that low background environment. Right. So as of right now, we've, we've done all the, the calculations on our dose rates. Right now, without controlling for potassium, that potassium-40 is about 90 98 or 99 percent of our current dose rate. Wow. Okay. So if we can get rid of potassium 40, or at least bump that down, then our our different our sub background environment that we're growing these systems in, we can get that even lower. We're talking 100 to even maybe a thousand times less than you would get oh, huh. um, in, in our control environments. That's not easy separating, you know, an it's, isotope. It's not that's when one, you're talking about one, one neutron, neutron part, difference yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so there are companies that you can buy. Potassium that is enriched in, in, in potassium 39, which is the uh, the non radioactive form of potassium. Okay. Okay. And so we've, we've obtained some of that. Problem is, it's expensive. And yeah, so no to, to run even just a small experiment, you're talking thousands of dollars just to get that potassium. Wow. Um, but we, we've, we've secured some of that. And so we're running the experiments right now. So we're, before we kind of get everything going, what we've got to do is is kind of culture these, these uh, we're doing it with yeast right now, mm -hmm. culture them for multiple generations in the, the low potassium 40 media so that they kind of exchange the, what, the potassium that's already within the cells and then uh, culture them a few times to kind of get that, their, their internal potassium levels are gonna be mainly right. that, that yeah. K39 and then bring them down to Snow Lab, grow them there for a while and, and, and really see what, what effect so that has. So do we have data yet? Have we, like, at Snow Lab or around the world at some of the other facilities, what effects do we see on biological organisms that grow up in either a, I mean, I guess there's no such thing, even with all these measures in place that have a no radiation environment to have right. an extraordinarily low background radiation. What, what happens to organisms in that environment? Yeah, so there's, Snow Lab is one of about three or four in the world right now that are where, we, where there's biology experiments going on. And so what they found is, is exactly kind of what we would have hypothesized based on what we know about giving low doses of radiation. Right. And it's, it's the opposite from that LNT model. Mm -hmm. So LNT would suggest that if you remove background radiation- You'll live forever. Things will be happy, you know, less, you know, right. less DNA damage, less cancer rates, less mm -hmm. mutations. Uh, but in fact, these groups have found the opposite. And so when you remove background radiation, things do worse, they grow slower, there's more mutation, um, wow. they're more prone to damage. So if you take a, a culture that's been in a sub-background environment and hit it with a really high dose of radiation, so kind of challenge the system with a, with a high dose, um, they're, they're not able to deal with that high dose stress as much, and, and so we see higher rates of DNA damage and, and mutations in them. It kind of reminds me of like, you know, when you put astronauts in space and you remove gravity. Um, you know, gravity is, is damaging and you know we spend our lives resisting it and you know you see these little old kyphotic ladies walking around like this because yeah. the gravity's been weighing on their shoulders for their whole lives um, or you know if you put someone UV light from the sun is dangerous so you know if we were to live in caves and never see sunlight you know it's I think it's an analogous argument where well they should be able to live longer because they're not being exposed to radiation or you could even take that further to say and this is kind of Donald Trump's theory on exercise right that you know the body can only handle a, a finite amount right. so just do as little as possible yeah um, um, so is that, is this kind of like a, you know, this seems like a bit of common sense, but one, is that why your hypothesis is essentially that some is good? Right, and so the, our hypothesis is that, yeah, that little bit that you get of background radiation just kind of helps to keep things functioning. Right. So when we've got antioxidant uh, systems within our cells, we have DNA repair machineries that can fix single-stranded and double-strand breaks, and so they're, they're constantly working within our cells. and. Right. and you know, some of that is from natural background radiation, some of it's just from normal cellular metabolism, right. cellular respiration. Um, so the, the theory that, that we have and what other groups have is that by removing background radiation, that they'll kind of slowly start to shut down some of those processes. It's like if you don't, if you don't work your biceps, they're going to lose atrophy it. away. Exactly. And so the same thing could be happening with our antioxidant and repair machineries within our cells and tissues. And so if you remove that background radiation, over time, and it's not going to happen immediately, right. but if you're talking you know, days or weeks in that environment, 
that they might kind of start to shut down some of those processes. Right. And so when you do get uh, you know, random mutations forming within the cells, they're not able to deal with that as well as uh, a normal background system. Okay, so before we close, there's one area of controversy um, that's impactful here in Canada because we have candy reactors and those do produce uh, small amounts of tritium and the right. anti-nuclear folks raise this as being a major concern because it's a, you know, an, I guess it creates a molecule analogous to water and that distributes in the body. Right. Um, and you know, I found it useful in conversations I've had with people that are worried about it to, to make that comparison to potassium-40. You know, they both, I believe, do beta decays, but potassium-40 is like 70 times stronger. But can, you, can we just have a little nerd out on you know, comparing tritium to other sources, how, how dangerous it is? Yeah, so, um, so tritium is one of the components of our, of our background dose that we get. Right. And so it's, naturally, it's without, naturally. Yeah, right. without and candies. It's, and, and even without candies, it's still going to yeah. be present at low amounts. Uh, you know, right. it's produced, it's one of, so I talked about cosmic radiation. And right. so when you have cosmic rays from space interacting with elements in, within our atmosphere, so tritium is actually one that can be produced that way. So it's going to be a low amount in, in water that we drink and, and things. And so it's, it's pretty low, though. In terms of our background radiation dose, it's pretty insignificant compared to potassium-40 uh, or, in particular, radon. So you know, potassium-40, it, it is, a, a, like you said, a beta decay, different energy of, of beta. Um, but we just have a lot more potassium that we're exposed to in, right. in food and, and things like that. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's kind of an analogous type of radiation exposure, but uh, we're exposed to a lot more just from of, of potassium than we are from tritium. Right, right, right. And, you know, the numbers are just, like, astounding to me in terms of, like, how many decays. You said, like, 150 atomic decays per, like, meter per square. Cubic meter, per cubic yeah. meter of yeah. air. Um, do you have any, do you have any, I know I'm like ambushing you off the hop here, but like in terms of potassium decays in the body, do you have any stats on that? Like how? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll have to think back to my, uh, my radiation go biology on, courses, on. but it, it's on the order of a couple of thousand. Right. Per so second? Per, so yeah, so when we talk about uh, Becquerel's, it's a decay per second. Right. So with potassium 40 and carbon 14 is another one too. Yeah. So we have both of them at pretty high levels in our bodies. And so it's on the order of several thousand becquerels of each isotope. So right. in one second, you've got a couple of thousand atoms of potassium 40 decaying within your body right now, right. emitting that beta and that gamma radiation. Right. Frying our DNA and then it getting repaired. Exactly. Okay, and one last thing, because uh, Douglas has, has kind of hinted at this before, but the, the repair mechanisms we have for DNA, most of the damage is being driven by oxygen, essentially, and a, like, and a small, much smaller fraction is being driven by radiation. But, but is it is they're the same sort of DNA repair mechanisms that we use for, for both, is that? Yeah, that's correct. So, so radiation works mainly through kind of indirect mechanisms, and so yeah. uh, the actual photon of radiation you're going to get exposed to doesn't necessarily directly damage your DNA. Right. It mainly works through the production of free radicals. Right. So things like hydroxyl radicals, the, these really short-lived but really reactive species within your, right. within your cells. And so that's where a lot of your DNA damage comes from. But normal cellular metabolism, uh, cellular respiration, also produces those those free radicals. Right. Unless and you're so on a special diet, right? No. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. You Eat can. Your you're still. Yeah. yeah. Well, so you're still breathing oxygen. Yeah. yeah. You can have antioxidant diets, which just give you more levels of the the things that can re, you know remove those those reactive species. Right. 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 But it, as long as you're breathing oxygen, you're still producing free radicals. And right. So, right. Uh, yeah, same same type of DNA damage that you're going to get. Same mechanism by which our cells repair them. Awesome. Okay, so again, this interview is supposed to be like five minutes, but this is a totally fascinating conversation. Oh, happy Chris. to talk as long as you want. Uh, amazing. Yeah, we'll have you back for sure. Great. Um, thank you again for coming on. And oh, we, thanks for uh, having me. Look forward to visit. I'm going to hopefully visit we'll Snow Lab. Yeah, yeah, for and we'll, sure. We'll bring we're, uh, the media we're a little team restricted right now still, I think, for, for, sure. for tours, for sure. but as soon as that opens up again, yeah, we'll get you up and Beautiful. we'll do, uh, can do, all, do some shots down there. And cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they love that. Looking forward to it. All right. Great. Thanks again. Yeah.